All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's DEI-focused conversation on breaking barriers for Native Americans seeking health care and organ transplants. My name is Deanna Fenton, Senior Manager of Program Development and Operations here at the Alliance, and I'd like to thank you all for being with us today for this discussion. Now, before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this is intended to be an engaging, open, and honest conversation. So over the course of today's uh, presentation, we'll certainly want to hear your thoughts. So if you have any comments that you'd like to share or any specific questions that you'd like to pose to our presenter, please feel free to submit them in the chat box at any point in time. Additionally, if you happen to be joining us as a group, I'd like to ask that you take this opportunity to complete the following poll to indicate approximately how many people have joined your group. Now, to kick off today's discussion, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our moderator, Nicole Salam, Director of Dir Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at LifeSource. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us today. And at this point, I'll leave it to you to get us started. Thanks so much, Deanna. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, as Deanna mentioned, my name is Nicole Salam, and um, I am honored and privileged to be with you all today and uh, very honored to. Uh, have the privilege of introducing Dr. Thomas Wyatt um, uh, as our speaker for today. Uh, just a quick um, overview of Dr. Wyatt. He is a board certified emergency medicine physician and is currently serving as the senior medical director for emergency services at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He has served on the Hennepin Healthcare Board as of directors for the past five years and also serves on the Life Source Clinical Policy Board and the Life Source Community Advisory Board. Dr. White grew up in Oklahoma and is an enrolled member of the Shawnee and Papa tribes. And after graduating from the University of Oklahoma with an undergraduate degree, he earned his medical degree at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine through the Indians into Medicine program. He is very active in tribal activities in Oklahoma, as well as being involved in numerous outreach initiatives in Minnesota um, Indigenous communities. He was recently selected to co-lead the development of the Indigenous Pathway Curriculum at the University of Minnesota Medical School. Um, what's great about Dr. Wyatt that I found out when I asked him this question was, uh, why did you get interested in, why were you interested in medicine? And uh, his uh, response to me was uh, he took an interest in medicine after being trained as a paramedic at the University of Oklahoma and then later enrolled in the Indians in uh, Medicine um, program in North Dakota. So before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Wyatt, um, we'll just say that today's presentation will not only focus on elevating health disparities in tribal communities, the original inhabitants who have been here in what we now call the United States for thousands of years, um, and the connection to conversations about organ tissue and eye donation in tribal communities, but will also uplift the timeless resilience of American Indian communities today. And what I'll ask you to do is today is to not only engage in today's um, webinar with your mind, but with your heart, and to tune into the stories of people who have endured unimaginable odds and are still here today. And so with that, Tom, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Nicole, uh, for that really warm introduction. Uh, nice to uh, be here with you all. It's, it's very much an honor for me to be here with you. I'm gonna actually start sharing my screen here. So what I want to do is I first want to start us off with um, a land acknowledgement. And I know that a lot of you have seen land acknowledgements uh, more and more, which is very appropriate. You've, you've heard the saying, I'm sure you're, you're on native land. We're all on native land. And I'm not going to read this, this land acknowledgement to you. I'm coming to you from Minneapolis uh, on the site of uh, Hennepin Healthcare right now. And I'll let you read this uh, while I'm talking. But one of the things I like to, to encourage people to do is to really think about the land acknowledgement in more of an active way, as more of a practice. And what, I'm, what do I mean by that? And what I mean is I think it's important to really honor that relationship uh, that you have with those um, who are, uh, that used to inhabit the land or that still inhabit the land where you are um, by actually, you know, 
becoming a participant in cultural events or donating to certain organizations that support the indigenous people in your area, um, kind of on your own time, learning about the people that are that inhabit that area. And you know, even inviting elders to open up events if that's appropriate. So uh, those are some ways I think that it's really important to become uh, more active in, in acknowledging uh, the land. And I know Nicole and I, you know, Nicole, you and I have talked about this before, and I think you feel pretty similar um, about looking at a land acknowledgement this way. Yes, um, I think um, what we've talked about and what we are certainly doing in our organization at LifeSource is looking at um, kind of going beyond the statement, but and really internalizing what that means for how we kind of live and move um, on this land. And so looking at it as a practice um, is something that is uh, something that we're learning to do and um, is very critical, I, I believe, to um, really understanding what we mean by honoring um, the land that we're on. Yes, agree, agree. Okay, um, you know, I, I included this slide. This is a slide of me when I was when I was eight years old. You know, I'm I'm here in my um, fancy war dance regalia, practicing my um, my my dancing in, in the living room, and I, I included this because it's a way for me to kind of center myself um, before I give a talk, and reminds myself, you know, I remind myself that I, at a very young age, uh, was very proud of who I was as an American Indian. And I was very fortunate to have um, you know, the culture and traditions kind of instilled in me by, by my mother and her side of the family. And again, I was fortunate to be uh, named by my, my grandfather, who was a tribal leader. And he gave me the Shawnee name of Maya Wikapui, which translates to horse that stands strong. And I'm part of the horse and deer clan. And what I've tried to do is to really uh, instill that sense of pride and identity into my own children. Um, my son, Jack, here on the left is a traditional war dancer. And um, many names in my tribe, the Shawnee tribe in particular, are actually passed down. They're not created anew. Um, my daughters actually have new names that were, that were given to them, created um, for them by one of our elders. But my, my son actually has my grandfather's name. His name is Nikanissimo which in Shawnee means the voice out front. Uh, and he's part of the Wolf Clan. My daughter, Sophia, in the purple, she's a, a fancy shawl dancer. And her name, uh, her Shawnee name is Malakwa Kamsi, which translates to one who gathers together. Uh, and she's part of the Turtle Clan, which is a really important clan in the uh, Shawnee tribe. And then finally, my youngest daughter, Stella, uh, her name, her Shawnee name is Holefita which translates to horse that stands pretty or right. It's really the mirror image, the female version of my name. Tom, could you just, before you before you head there, is, is just talk a little bit about the significance of names in tribal communities? Yeah, of course. So this question gets asked a lot whenever um, people um, want to know what's the most appropriate way to um, address um, you know, a gathering of, of, of Indians. So is what's the most appropriate term? Is it Native American? Is it American Indian? Is it indigenous? Um, and what I'd like to tell people is that it, it's really appropriate just to ask. And I think a lot of tribal members will identify by their tribe more than more so by, you know, any particular term like American Indian or Native American. And even more specifically, if you are, are happen to uh, have a conversation, you're trying to get to know someone and really ask them about themselves um, in a culturally appropriate way, you know, asking, you know, where, where are you from? Um, you know, what tribe are you? Um, and if you um, even take it a step further, it become a little more personal is, and do you have, um, do you have a name? Do you have a traditional name? Those names, like I said, are, that are, um, at least in my tribe, the Shawnee tribe, have, holds a, a pretty um, incredible significance in the tribe, um, given that they're passed down. Um, and then to have someone um, create a name is also a really important thing that's called a naming ceremony and um, very, very important for the family, for the for the tribe. And it's something that, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an example of a cultural practice that uh, we at, at Hennepin Healthcare um, have tried to introduce as an example of, a, you know, culturally appropriate care, bringing in, you know, indigenous culture into the hospital 
uh, when needed. And I can provide an example of that, you know, later later during the discussion, if you'd like. This is a slide that I actually put in here just to really honor my mother, who's um, one of the elders of both the, the Kwapa and the Shawnee tribe. She's 87 years old. And in this picture uh, uh, with my family, this is from last summer's powwow. She's obviously the oldest person in, 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 the, in the picture. And I contrast that with the black and white photo where she's the youngest. Uh, she's the little girl in the, in the middle in the upper, in the, in the upper row. And she's there with her uh, four sisters, two brothers and her parents. In this slide, in, in, in order to honor my mother, I'd like to talk about the concept of family and community among American, Indian, uh, American Indians in, a, in the culture. And in many ways, I think uh, it's a mistake to sometimes overgeneralize American Indians because there are so many different tribes. There's over 500 you know, federally recognized tribes in the country. But in this sense, I think this idea that family and community is much more important uh, than the individual is really an important concept. And I think especially with healthcare professionals uh, and those uh, involved in, in transplantation and organ donation, knowing that when you're gonna have these really intimate conversations with, uh, with Indians, you're gonna, you're gonna see probably not just one, you're gonna see a whole gathering of them. And it's really an important thing to embrace that concept. Okay, um, you know, it's really difficult to understand this unique relationship between American Indians and um, colonizers without kind of uh, reviewing some history. And this is a, a slide that I developed a few years back. I kind of challenged myself to put um, many important um, dates of events that have affected American Indians over the course of the last 500 years or so. Uh, and it was challenging. And I, I see that it needs to be updated too. There are some things that can go on the other side of the timeline now, like the American Indian Religious Freedom Act and the uh, um, you know, Indigenous Child Welfare Act, Indian Child Welfare Act, et cetera. But one thing that I like to point out is that this is not the history that I learned growing up. Um, and I think more and more, whenever I talk to um, the younger generations, they are starting to learn this history, which is really important. And you know, I think most people understand that uh, at first contact, um, first contact with with uh, colonizers, with settlers, was not a great thing for American Indians. Um, they brought a lot of diseases, um, things like smallpox, which gets a lot of press, but really it was measles, tuberculosis, influenza, those types of things that American Indians had no natural immunity to that really decimated a lot of the tribes at the time. Certainly, there were wars between tribes and also with colonizers. Um, but then began this period of policies that were promoted and developed by the government at the highest level, including our president, with the idea and the goal um, to really um, remove Indians from the land so that settlers could move in. Because really the, the land is the, the biggest, most precious natural resource that we have in this country. So that began the, those years of those policies. And what we're gonna focus on um, on this timeline today, for the most part, is uh, boarding schools. Whenever I used to uh, give this talk and I um, would, you know, if we were together in a room right now, I'd I would ask for a show of hands about how many people knew about um, government-sponsored boarding schools as they pertain to American Indians. And again, you know, it used to be not many people would raise their hands, but it seems more and more that people are learning about and hearing about, and there's a lot more awareness about boarding schools and what that means. Tom, just want to note a comment by Daryl. Daryl, good to see that you're you're here. Um, just noted to um, uh, one fact about the, the 1680 Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico. So thank you, Daryl, for pointing that out. So Dom, as you're thinking about, um, as you kind of gone through this and you're learning and you've learned about these um, this timeline. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how understanding this history has has informed your work um, as a doctor and sharpened perhaps sharpened your lens on working in American Indian communities? Yeah, I, I, that's that's a great question. And I think that we'll talk about a lot of the, the those things. Um, 
in, in this actual lecture. Um, I think for me, again, it's about understanding the history and really making those links to why there are so many disparities. You know, and I, I hate to talk so much about deficits and disparities when you talk about American Indians. It seems like that's where, you know, a lot of these talks actually start, but it's so important to understand why there's such a, you know, burden of disease, chronic disease in American Indians. So understanding the history really does link to why there's so many health and social disparities these days, if that, if that makes sense. So boarding school. So this was the, really the climate that American Indians were living in during the middle part of the um, 19th century. So this is a famous quote by the, um, the superintendent of the first government-sponsored boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, Captain uh, Richard Pratt, kill the Indian and save the man. And you know, Richard um, Richard Pratt was someone who was basically recruited to um, start the boarding schools. He had his career as a um, in the army, in the military, and then he also uh, was pretty influential in reforming the the penal system, the prison system down in Florida. And so he took those ideas from the military and then the prison system and tried to apply them to boarding schools with this idea that um, Indians had to be civilized. They had to be assimilated. And this is a picture of what a, a young Indian youth might look like before and after going and starting to attend one of these boarding schools. And this also is a, is a famous quote um, by Richard Pratt. This is a very famous photo of the Carlisle Indian School, one of the first years um, that it started to run around 1860 or so. And what I've um, grown to think is that if you are going to pick one photo that really um, illustrated cultural genocide, this might be the one. What, what I'd like to say, um, and Tom and I had um, quite a bit of conversation about this photo in particular, and um, the immense uh, immensity of it, and thinking about, sometimes when we think about genocide, <clears throat> we may think about the, uh, the actual killing uh, physical death of uh, American Indians. And yet what this picture represents is the cultural genocide of a community. Um, slow death, so stripping of culture, stripping of traditional dress, cutting of hair, stripping of language. Um, this is a picture of that and I think this is what we would ask you just to sit with and understand what Tom was talking about when we think about the connection of early experiences to health disparities and where those origins started. This is also a secondary slide that shows uh, Carlisle as well. Very similar picture to the one prior. And then I think, you know, just to support what Nicole had just said about um, this concept of being separated forcibly from your family and taken many times, you know, hundreds of miles away and this idea that you are going to have your culture all the things that you knew maybe that sense of pride that you had instilled before and that was going to be taken away or you were told that it was uh, it, it was evil or, or it was bad and then systematically you know that culture was erased by doing things like cutting hair cutting hair and i would say most 
tribes uh, is a really, really intimate thing. I mean, most of the time, whenever we cut our hair, it's because somebody has died close to you and your family. So to do that without consent or without much thought is, is pretty significant. And then you see pictures here of um, likely forced you know, inoculations, um, vaccines, how people are sitting in, in rows in school and, and, and being taught, you know, probably new religion, new things that are foreign, um, really that goes against a lot of what um, American Indian, young American Indian children had learned up to that point. Mm -hmm. This idea of corporal punishment was a relatively new thing as well, that a lot of these kids um, not only experienced, but probably, um, you know, took back uh, if they did make it back to their to their own um, their homelands, an amount of you know abuse uh, of all kinds, sexual abuse, physical, emotional abuse, uh, is well documented. So there's been you know a lot of researchers that have focused on intergenerational trauma. One that's um, probably most influential is someone that named uh, Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart from the University of New Mexico. And what she describes in, I'll read this uh, from the boarding school period, she describes six phases of intergenerational trauma. And she describes the boarding school period as destroyed family system, beatings, rape, prohibition of native language and religion. Lasting effect is ill-prepared for parenting and identity confusion. And so one of the things I also get asked is what, why are we, why do we have to talk about this now? Why are we, what, how does this important for a, you know, a large group of health professionals, healthcare professionals, et cetera. And again, it goes back to really understanding the history and making that link to um, historical trauma and some of the chronic diseases that we see today. And, you know, one of the things that has, is a relatively new field of study is something called epigenetics. Epigenetics, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of it, is basically this concept that genes can be changed um, when one is exposed to chronic stress, chronic stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline. Um, basically, they've shown that those genes can actually change um, to people who, are, who experience that over long periods of time. And then you have to think, how does that link to some of these chronic diseases we see today? This is not a new concept. Um, I think so, you know most people um, have heard of this concept of adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. And the thing about this study, it's a, it was a rather landmark study that was done um, in the 1990s. Um, and it was done basically with a large, I think it was 17 or 18,000 people um, in the Kaiser Permanente healthcare system in California. And these, th this was a survey that was done on um, mostly college educated, um, predominantly white people. So these are people that have access to healthcare and maybe other privilege. And what they found was that there is this dose um, response relationship between the number of adverse childhood experiences that you can read there um, to chronic diseases later in life. We're not just talking about, you know, substance abuse and mental illness. We're talking about true diseases, cancer, more likely to get develop certain types of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, based on um, mistreatment as a child. We've got a couple of comments here in the uh, chat um, as well. Um, I think one of these we'll get to later. Um, Tom, could you speak to, so looking at the, the ACEs as it's outlined here, so connection with adverse childhood experiences and adverse community environments, could you talk about how you and your practice have seen the interplay between uh, these, two, these two pieces, particularly in the American Indian community? Any examples you can provide? I think that if you look at the number of, you know, we have what we call a community health needs assessment, like like all hospitals do, all nonprofit hospitals. 
And what we have found that, you know, every three years when that gets conducted, um, that there is an overwhelming correlation here that we see. And we see it in disparities every day with our urban American Indian population. Um, some of them are, you know, diseases of despair, like uh, opiate um, addiction. You know, how in, in Minnesota, um, Minnesota Department of Health just came out with this, with this data a few months back, and they showed that you're seven times more likely to die of an opiate overdose if you're American Indian in Minnesota compared to a white person. If you're if you're black, you're twice as likely. But if you're American Indian, you're seven times more likely to die of an overdose. So that's just an example. I, and I think that um, looking at this this concept that again has been kind of um, proven that childhood mistreatment can lead to uh, real disease later on in life. Um, it really is what informs the work. But again, it's just the, the the awareness of it, the understanding of it. Because if you see a lot of patients, you start to see patterns um, and you have to think about, you know, new approaches to treating patients you know, that have, that have um, been exposed to this, you know, the concept of trauma-informed care, which we can certainly talk about later, uh, that a lot of people are embracing um, really takes this, this type of thing into account. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you. And this slide really just points out that um, compared to all, all other races, American Indians continue to die at higher rates, in just about every category. Talking specifically about transplant and organ donation in the American Indian community is, is quite interesting and we'll get to We'll get to uh, a campaign and initiative that, that we did here in Minnesota here in just a moment, but it's really it's striking, you know, that American Indians make up about one to two percent of the total population in the United States, and there's about I think the last I read is it's 0.8 percent uh, American Indians on the, the transplant waiting list, and this is all all types of transplants, but they receive fewer transplants um, of those uh, versus whites that are on the list. So there are obviously some barriers there about, about why that is. Uh, American Indians donate at a lower rate and they comprise a lower percentage of living donors specifically with um, um, kidney, kidney donation. So there, there are probably some myths in the, within the American Indian community as well that prevent more living donors. And that's, an, that's a really interesting question. And there, there have been a lot of people that have been looking into that as well. And I include this in there just as an example of uh, barriers to kidney transplants in particular. And I think that you can look at this list and, and see um, after what I kind of had just explained uh, about historical trauma and adverse childhood events, uh, the prevalence of chronic diseases, uh, that these are not just you know, health disparities here as well, they're social disparities, access to care. So I think a lot of the work um, in the, the um, organ donation community is looking at how do we overcome some of these barriers, right? How do you do, what, what, what upstream things can you do to really affect and overcome these barriers? Now I'll talk a little bit about the, the campaign I referred to, and I think Nicole can certainly help me with this, is that you know this was a, a campaign I was involved, asked to be involved in in 2017. Um, it was a collaboration between the Minnesota Department of Health and LifeSource, um, the uh, organ procurement organization that Nicole mentioned that she's employed by. Um, and it was really unique in that it involved you know looking at a, um, culturally appropriate way to raise awareness in the American Indian community for organ donation. And what um, the work was really fascinating and, and very appropriate, I think, too, because it really did bring in focus groups from the communities, from the tribal communities, both uh, out on reservation and, and um, community lands, but also within the urban uh, communities. And um, you know, it, it was well coordinated, and you know, we had a lot of um, different 
ways that we advertised social media, things like bus, you know, bus wraps and billboards and those types of things. And for me, it was, it was a very meaningful experience. I think, um, Nicole, I know that LifeSource uh, recently is, is planning on trying to expand this uh, type of uh, initiative to uh, other states. Correct, correct. Yes, um, we're actually very excited about that. Uh, so as Tom, as you mentioned, um, and I think it was actually 2016, um, that LifeSource had received funding from, as you mentioned, the Minnesota Department of Health um, to create culturally appropriate um, outreach for American Indian communities in Minnesota, specifically as a way of elevating conversations about donation um, in tribal communities. Uh, and where we're at right now is um, really looking to expand that, that campaign uh, to reach more communities um, and continue uh, not only the conversation, but just thinking about um, organ donation, organ tissue and eye donation as a part of kind of wholeness and health. When we talk about health is uh, allowing people the opportunity to choose um, to be a donor um, at the end of life um, and uh, not putting families in a position to have to make that decision. And so we know for a lot of communities, and uh, Sylvia, I think this is getting at your, um, kind of your question about why there are lower rates of, of donor rates in um, underrepresented communities. Um, there are several reasons for that, that we recognize. And some of those are that there are a lot of myths about um, donation. There's a lot of miseducation about donation. Um, as uh, Tom mentioned, there's there's a very difficult relationship with the healthcare system and, and many um, communities of color, indigenous communities. And so there's, there's a need to really build some trust. Um, and I think what's significant, uh, Tom, about the work that you're doing and your participation in this campaign is that as a trusted leader, as a trusted messenger in the community, um, it's important that we hear from individuals and communities about their experiences, um, their uh, stories around donation and transplantation that can be very powerful for um, helping people make the decision. Absolutely, and I think that one of the stories out of this particular initiative that um, really touched a lot of people, and maybe you can talk a little bit about um, the work that while you're in North Dakota right now is Cassandra's son and what an impact that had on a number of people. Yeah, so I, I'm just returning from uh, Belcourt, North Dakota, where we, um, we've been working with the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, um, uh, Joan, Azure, who's also a member of our community advisory council, um, uh, has been extremely instrumental in um, rallying her community around um, donation. And so what we, uh, myself and a few of my colleagues were able to do was um, invited to an event in Belcourt um, with Turtle Mountain, um, who uh, decided as a community based on the legacy of Grayson, Lawrence uh, Parisian, who was the grandson of Joan, um, who uh, received a transplant, um, her transplant in 2019, I believe, and then uh, unfortunately passed away shortly thereafter, uh, rallied and advocated for her community to um, um, add donation, registration for donation on tribal IDs. So Turtle Mountain is the first in the, in the nation to do that. And which I think speaks to the power of advocacy and speaks to the power of stories around um, the importance of becoming a donor. Yeah, agree, agree. And, and um, I think there I see some things in the chat too about myths within certain tribes. And I think that's something we can certainly um, talk a little bit more about um, you know, when we have the, uh, the discussion time. Um, I think that's really important. And there's, I think we're seeing a little bit of a shift between um, you know, traditional thinking and looking at kind of the, the reality of the, the burden of disease we're seeing in a lot of these communities. And we can certainly talk about that. And I'll, I'll share an example of um, me trying to find out some of the, about some of the myths in my own tribes. It was really fascinating. 
but this was uh, this campaign was really one of the most important things I've, I've been involved in. And I think that um, it does have the potential to, uh, as we like, as you said, expand to um, South Dakota uh, and North Dakota really um, affect a lot more people, at least I'm hoping. We just have a, I have a couple more slides, a couple more different concepts that I want to kind of get through before we before we end here and open up for discussion. You know, um, one of the things I, I am also asked about historical trauma uh, is, you know, what can we actually do about it, and how can American Indians heal about heal in, in terms of, you know, all the things that have been uh, have done to them, and. This is a slide uh, that um, I think is a good way to start talking about that, about what can be done. So this is, um, some of you may know, is uh, the Secretary uh, of the Interior, uh, Deb Halland. Uh, she is um, a Laguna Pueblo from New Mexico, and she is the very first American Indian cabinet member that was appointed ever in the history of our country, appointed by, by um, President Biden. And she did something very courageous um, within the first few weeks of taking office. And what she said was that we really need to, we being her and her de department, really need to dedicate a lot of resources to um, uncovering the truth about the atrocities related to boarding schools in this country. And she was taking, um, Taking some uh, lessons from Canada, who had already started to do this in terms, you know, looking at the atrocities in boarding schools um, among the first tribes nations there. So she actually, you know, did what she was said she was going to do. She devoted a lot of resources and a lot of funding to teams of researchers that were using a technology to really uncover um, mass graves and in some instances, um, starting in the eastern part of the United States. And her her goal is to um, with her project is to really uh, look at most of, if not all, those areas um, that um, used to have boarding schools. So just to give you an idea, you know, in the state of Minnesota, there's 16 boarding schools. Uh, where I grew up in Oklahoma, in the state of Oklahoma, there's around 80. So there's a lot of these sites out there. And what I want to share with you um, on the next slide is just an example of uh, what I think healing looks like uh, when we talk about um, in investigating boarding schools. So these are two pictures um, taken from the Rosebud uh, Reservation in South Dakota. Sorry for this, sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm in my office here. Um, so this is from last summer. And what had happened was a team of research had discovered uh, the remains of nine children from um, Carlisle, and they identified them as uh, children that had been taken from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, uh, which is the home of the Sachangus uh, Sioux. And so they sent their youth council to go to Pennsylvania to bring back the remains. So this is a picture of the caravan, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is obviously a picture of some tribal members helping to carry the remains back into um, uh, the tent to prepare them for ceremony. This is a um, pretty emotional set of pictures here, very painful to look at. But I, I, I think as painful as it is, it actually is a way to really start the healing process. Um, going back to what Dr. Braveheart, Yellow Horse Braveheart says about uh, what she feels is a way to heal from historical trauma. She says, first you have to confront it, and then you have to understand it. You have to release the pain from it. And then you can transcend it. So she really believes um, that there is a way to heal from um, historical trauma and, and, and the awareness, um, the acknowledgement of it is just the first step.
And Tom, just going back to the earlier slide with the, the children in the boarding school is just seeing a link here to the resilience of American Indian communities. And as you mentioned, the healing um, from generations of trauma, that cultural genocide that we talked about earlier, but the ability to heal and be resilient in the face of uh, so much pain and hurt. Yeah, absolutely, Nicole. And that really um, kind of um, segues well into my next slide that I have. And again, I, I I need to figure out a way to really talk about this at the beginning of of one of these types of lectures or webinar because I think again, you know, one of the things, and I'm guilty of it as well, is that there's always a focus on the deficits, you know, and, and the disparities when we so much so often when we talk about American Indians, but there is significant strengths and positives within, um, you know, virtually all tribes in this country, and the idea, you know, that we're we are still here and the resiliency. Um, some people don't like the word resilience. Some people like the word survivor. You know, um, either one. I think that you know there are reasons to really celebrate. And there's a you know there is a, a sense of um, uh, there's a renaissance. It seems like there's a revitalization of a lot of um, things in, in the culture. In the in the if you look at it across things like the entertainment industry and the political uh landscape like i mentioned the culinary scene um you know there's a number of different um areas where there's you know american indians in prominent positions science and technology we have a, a female american indian astronaut in space right now who's running basically up on the space station amazing um but just a few things to point out you know the this idea of land rights and recovery is a, is a real issue and it's interesting that deb holland the secretary of the interior basically has a lot of influence over public lands, um, both, you know, in, in the lower 48 and particularly in, in Alaska, where there's these fights uh, to try to privatize these, uh, some of these public lands, uh, say, for instance, in the Arctic areas of Alaska uh, and in Utah and, you know, in an area called Bears Ears. And these are sacred sites, um, what a lot of tribes consider very sacred. So this idea of trying to privatize the land to sell it off, so you know minerals could be extracted, et cetera, it's a real, um, it's a real debate right now in our country, and I'm thankful that Secretary Holland again will have um, at least some influence on how some of these decisions are made about what to do with that land. Um, there are other examples, you know, for instance, in the Boundary Waters here uh, in Minnesota. Um, Scanning Rock, which is a lot of you have heard of in terms of the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. So there's a lot of, um, you know, American Indians being very uh, much active as, as activists trying to defend the land. The idea of uh, language revitalization, um, kind of recognizing that that's a way to really preserve their culture. And so we're seeing a lot of these language programs that are coming, in, you know, in secondary schools, and, you know, not just tribal colleges and that sort of thing, but you know there are several different language courses and American Indian languages throughout universities around the country. I mean, I, this is really an important thing. I touched a little bit on culturally specific trauma-informed approaches like trauma-informed care. Again, that I'm happy to talk more about um, during discussion. Um, traditional food programs. You know, we have an award-winning win restaurant here in Minneapolis called Awamni, which won the James Beard Award as the best restaurant in the country, best new restaurant in the country. And this idea of pre-colonial foods is really the, the main um, concept uh, um, that is being promoted. Um, the idea that, you know, Indians used to be healthy um, before, uh, you know, food was used essentially as a weapon against them. Uh, they were uh, many were relocated to food deserts and um, given commodity foods that they had never uh, eaten before. You know things like enriched flour, and refined sugar, and dairy products. And you know there have been again people that have looked at the direct correlation between eating habits, obesity, and the uh, uh, over overrepresented amount of diabetes uh, that's pretty prevalent uh, for a lot of American Indian tribes. 
And then the idea of, of nationalism, I put this in there, you know, national, nationalism is a word that is often um, seen in, uh, you know, associated uh, with a negative connotation, especially if you think about things like World War II. Uh, but nationalism in the sense that American Indians still um, sign up to defend the country at a higher rate than any other race. I mean, they're really proud of this country and no matter what has been done that they still want to defend it. So it's really an important thing, especially we just, you know, Veterans Day was just uh, just a few few days ago. And it's something that, to also remember that American Indians are really um, proud to serve in the military. So I'll end my comments, uh, at least for that, for that part of the lecture there, and um, wanted to provide a resource list. I encourage, uh, encourage all of you, if you haven't seen um, some of the videos from the talk donation campaign, um, we included them at the very, um, it's the last uh, item there on the resource list. Um, I think they're really well done. And I just wanna say uh, thank you very much for allowing me to come speak to you today. And I look forward to talking with you some more and answering questions. Thanks so much, Tom. And I'm, I'm multitasking here. So um, really good questions in the chat, great comments in the chat. Um, so before we, before we open this up, and it's great because we've got we've got a little extra time. Um, I would imagine that we're going to have a lot of questions coming in, in addition to the questions we've already had uh, presented to us prior. Um, so, Tom, if there were a couple of uh, kind of overarching things that you would encourage people to take away from your presentation today, I um, would be curious to think about what those are. So we um, we've heard a lot of really great information. Um, with regard to uh, understanding historical trauma and how that connects to health disparities in American Indian communities. Um, you mentioned um, uh, just the timeline that you, that you provided um, and all of the things that kind of led us to this point um, and uh, uh, focus specifically on boarding schools and how uh, children were impacted um, and being stripped of their, um, their cultural identity, uh, their language, traditions, customs, um, being torn away from their families, families being separated, understanding um, how important communities, uh, families are in American Indian communities. And then you walked us through um, how some of those, uh, those disparities play out today. Um, several things that were covered in your presentation. Um, looking at intergenerational trauma um, and how that also impacts generations of communities uh, connected to health. So again, if there were two or three things that, that you um, would highlight for, for folks today um, on this webinar, what would those be? What, what would you encourage people to take away from today? Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot in there, I know, I think that the two big take home things would be to really start considering, you know, your American Indian patients in a different light, given what you know about historical trauma. And maybe that, that um, a lot of times people, when they understand that, they, they understand why um, American Indians um, do have disparities related to, you know, organ donation and transplants. So it's really important to understand that historical connection. It's really important. So I think if you don't understand that, then you're always left wondering, you know, why there are certain disease states, for instance, that are more prevalent and why there are um, other, again, kind of talking about the, the deficits, um, why those things exist. Um, it's important to understand that. I think it's important to understand also um, the idea along those same lines about why there's, uh, you know, so much mistrust with healthcare system. Um, because a lot of times, you know, you know, I see some of the comments here and, and there, it, it is quite interesting, right? That American Indians, maybe they have a chance, for instance, in um, being, being a living do a kidney donor to really help someone in their community or their family. But a lot of, there's a lot of reluctance there because there's a lot of mistrust still 
uh, with the healthcare system. Um, so those are the two big things I think um, that I would really stress. And then of course, you know, learning more about the, the positives, like I tried to accentuate it at, at the very end, but there is a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes, there. Uh, Tom and I discussed having a um, a series. I think you could easily do a series on on this presentation. And so I thank you for uh, succinctly um, putting a lot <laughs> into about forty minutes here. Mm -hmm. um, so we um, have again several questions here. So what I think I'll do is I'll start with a couple of questions in the chat, and then there's some um, really quick great questions that relate specifically to um, uh, donation and, and transplantation that we can uh, we can try to, to move through here. So um, one of the first questions that came up, let me go back here, um, earlier was, um, and then Wooten, Wooten Cam um, asked the question, what impact if you're able to speak to this, Tom, what impact could the pending outcome of the Supreme Court case relating to a federal law or related to the fostering and adoption of Native American children have on the community? Um, and there's a desire to understand the, the perspective, your perspective on this. Sure. So the reference is to, to, to ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act. So um, I don't know the exact date. I think it was in the mid 70s that the Indian Child Welfare Act was um, enacted by Congress as a way to protect American Indian children, essentially, because uh, what it showed was that American Indian children were getting um, taken away from their families and placed into foster homes with um, non-Indian predominantly white foster parents. And in order to prevent that, the Indian Child Welfare Act was, uh, like I said, enacted. And what the significance of overturning that and making it unconstitutional, and the argument is it's based on race, um, would be that it would challenge the sovereignty of a lot of uh, American Indian tribes to really govern their own tribes. It would also, um, you know, there's the chance that it could resort back to um, placing native children in non-native homes. And luckily we've seen that the number of, of native children going into foster care steadily decrease over the years, but it's still relatively high compared to, to whites, for, uh, for example. And then there's, a, there's an argument about what it would do um, and there's this race versus political argument that do you do you belong to a tribe based on your race or do you belong to a tribe because of policy? That's what I mean by being political. And it's due to policy that the federal government enacted. So it's a rather complex issue, but a lot of a lot of um, proponents of ICWA are um, not worried necessarily because they feel like you know. One of the Supreme Court justices, Judge uh, Gorsuch, um, basically is an expert on Indian law, and he has some influence over other justices. So there's a feeling that it probably won't get overturned. But if it did, then I think the repercussions would be kind of what I what I outlined. But also, how does how do American Indians get to define themselves for the future, right? Um, that, that will be interesting because again, this is a really complicated topic when we talk about blood quantum and how you can be a, a, a member of a tribe but not necessarily be Indian. Again, that's a political thing. It's based, based on policy that the tribe creates. So there's a lot of, of kind of competing issues there, but it, it will have an, an effect um, on, on the sovereignty of tribes and who can define themselves as an Indian. Great, thank you. Um, Knowing that there's some others um, on the call um, that might also be able to address some of these questions, I would invite you to uh, please go ahead and do that in the chat. Uh, let's see. So we've got a couple questions too around the why of lower organ donation rates um, in American Indian communities. Um, that came up. I don't know if you would want to say anything additional to that. Um, and then I, I know Daryl, I think you, um, 
mentioned something too in the chat here. Um, if you're on and you can unmute, Daryl, I'm not sure if you can do that. Um, um, feel free. Hi, everybody. Tom, amazing. Love the uh, presentation. I was saying hello to you from here in uh, Albuquerque. Great. Hi, Daryl. Thank you very much. So just real quick, uh, that's a greeting from uh, the Pueblo of Jemez. Uh, I serve as New Mexico Donor Services as their Native American Affairs Coordinator. So it's an honor and a pleasure to join all of you here and to listen to your presentation. It's uh, wonderful and very informative, and I am enjoying your work. Um, if there's anything I can add or any questions I can assist with, you know, I'd be more than happy to. Um, when you mentioned South Dakota, I started laughing right away. I'm a graduate at Briarcliff in uh, Sioux City, Iowa. So I ran all over in Yankton, Vermilion, Brookings, Sioux Falls. So it's wonderful. Um, one of the issues uh, and what we're running into here in uh, New Mexico is a lot of the traditionals. A lot of the older elder generation will state to us, you can't because of our culture, our ways of life. In Towa, what they say is, meaning you come in whole as a person and you leave out whole. So some of those barriers, traditional barriers, are very key to understand. And in particular, as you stated, Tom, the circle of the family, who will be the lead person to discuss with. And you pretty much hit almost everything dead on on what we run into in New Mexico. And I'm sure other organizations, whether it be Oklahoma, Arizona, or California probably do as well. Yeah, thank Daryl. Thank you for that for that insight and for for the work that you do. Very very good to meet you. Hatito nakanate haki washala samoa. That's my Shawnee greeting for. Very nice to know you. Um, I will say, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think you put in the the question about you know what are some of the myths that you encounter in your in your tribe. And I asked my mom. I was like, you know, after um, getting invited to to work with Talk to Nation, I, I, I asked my mom, again, who's like a tribal elder and has a lot of historical knowledge about both the Shawnee and the Quapa tribe. And I was like, mom, is there something that says that we that can't be an, an organ donor? And she looked at me and she said, I think so. So <laughs> I was like, okay, can you help me out with more than that? Can you maybe ask some you know people you know and stuff? And what she came back with was, there is more of a belief, not so much spoken like you said, Daryl, um, very eloquently in your language, but there was this idea that you should leave the earth the same way that you came into the earth, whole. But you know, when you think about that, and what I what I meant when I said there there is a maybe a little bit of a cultural transition going on. If you think about that, people who have really bad diabetes and get like a limb amputated, I mean that goes against that and, and it, so you have to kind of balance right the the traditional way with what is kind of reality and i think what i've heard just from a few limited sources is that some of these tribes where you know it, the, the the decision the discussion is you know can we say that we're going to honor tradition but on the same hand you know organ donation is really preserving the culture and preserving our children and helping our tribe so I think that that's where some of the discussion is going. Um, and I, I think that that's probably, given the rates of diabetes and, you know, and chronic disease, um, I, I think that's probably um, a thing that will positively affect some of these tribes, if that makes sense. I don't know your, what your thoughts are. Look you right, Jesse, it looks like Daryl. Oh, there, there he is. <laughs> Yeah, because um, one of the things that I discuss with people is, you know, we have have so much of Western medicine and Western society interwoven with our communities. For example, when someone says, I have a headache, you don't hear them say, go drink your Indian tea. They say, go get the Tylenol or, you know, my stomach is acting up instead of saying, no, you should give that. Go boil your cedar. 
Now they say, get the Pepto. So, so much of Western medicine and Western society is interwoven within our communities. And also stating what you said, Tom, is the way you come into the earth and with the advent of technology in Western society, you wear glasses, I wear contacts. So does that mean we're not going to be able to cross back to our ancestors? If someone has hearing aids, do they not cross back in? I mean, you know, to talk to some of the elders, to make them think because surgeries and advent of this type of healthcare did not exist in the olden days. But now we're here at the forefront trying to help out our people in continuing the circle of life, continuing our ways and our culture and our knowledge. And this is something brand new, you know, as you stated earlier about politics, it's so brand new that just like voting, we have to educate and keep educating our peoples to ensure our ways of life are still upheld. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, in, in just thinking about even other things that are implanted, like, you know, um, defibrillators or, you know, joint replacements, that sort of thing. I think in the context of this is, you know, helping to preserve life um, might be a, a one way to kind of continue to approach and um, raise that awareness. Like you said, that we're in a new, we're in a different age. And even though traditional beliefs are really important, sometimes you you also have to think about things in the context of today, here, now, and, you know, the legacy that you have the potential to to leave versus some of the old ways that um, it was a different time. Not to mean that they're not important and you can't somehow figure out a way to continue to honor those traditions, but it's where we're living in a different time and this is a, a separate, a different, a different issue, so to speak. I agree with you. Thanks, Daryl, for coming on. It's um, it's really great to have you um, on and to have the two of you having a conversation. Um, I want to just make sure that we get to a couple of questions that are in the chat here too. Um, so, Selena, Selena, um, hope I'm saying your name right. Um, posed a question about barriers for patients um, that they meet um, that have financial barriers. Um, so, the question is. Are there any financial resources for patients from Native American communities after transplant? Uh, the transplant center that uh, Selena is speaking about requires patients to stay locally for at least six weeks. Yeah, that, that is a question I've been asked before. And I don't know, I, I do know one thing, Selena, and that, that certain types of funding for American Indians, such as the Indian Health Service, don't make very much allowance for those types of um, financial, um, you know, obligations, so to speak. There's not much funding for that. I think thinking about that, though, um, that would be a great initiative to try to develop a way, some type of a foundation, perhaps that would could be created and funded um, both publicly and privately to try to help um, those types of patients. And I would certainly welcome. Any of those uh, on the call, um, Daryl uh, or anyone else that has more information about this or more, probably have more experience than I would as an emergency physician about this, this topic. Thank you. So other comments, just appreciation for uh, the presentation, um, for stressing, teaching the understanding um, as it applies to health diseases, transplantation. Uh, hadn't thought about the genocide and the loss of culture until today. Great to hear. Um, very insightful expansion of knowledge. So just letting you know, you got some, you had some kudos, some love here um, to both of you. Um, I'm going to shift it here to some of the questions that that folks asked uh, prior to um, really great questions, uh, specifically related to again organ donation <clears throat> and transplantation. So you talked about some of the uh, barriers most commonly faced um, in um, American Indian communities. Um, curious for, um, we had talked about too, some of the myths, specifically myths that are held in um, American Indian communities about donation, about organ tissue and eye donation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thought that the body needs to be whole before transitioning or when transitioning. 
Um, anything else that that you would add to that um, that question? I think um, that is the big myth. I think that that a lot of American Indians hold, and there's another one I think that's fairly common, and that is when we talk about you know becoming a living donor, and that it's just it's it's the not having the knowledge that people can live with one kidney, right? Some people feel like if they get a kidney, if they donate a kidney, then they're going to become very ill themselves. And, and the overwhelming um, number of people that do donate, have they live a normal life. And so I think it's just kind of getting that, that awareness out and that education out is really important because, um, yeah, I, I think that that was one of the things that we actually learned from, from Talk Donation and one of, the, one of the focus groups is that there was a lot of misinformation out there. Or lack of knowledge about that. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. One of the other questions, which is a really great question, and I think this is one that we, um, as an OPO at Life Source, um, sometimes are, are in a position to kind of think about and explore um, when approaching uh, families about donation, um, specifically Native American, American Indian families. Um, anything you would offer in terms of for participants around what considerations to keep in mind when um, a family member has transitioned, <clears throat> excuse me, or um, there's the possibility that um, the family needs to be approached um, knowing that the, the, the patient is brain dead. Um, anything you would offer around professionals who are approaching American Indian families specifically. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts that I, but I, I kind of want to hear with Daryl or others that actually deal with with uh, this on a uh, regular basis have to say. But I can tell you what I, my experience, what I think are really important. So we'll open it up if anyone has any thoughts about that. Um, we certainly had a couple folks from Life Source um, share their thoughts, but I would invite anyone on the call if anyone has any thoughts. I think keeping the cultural, um, you know, the cultural piece at the forefront is really important. I think, you know, checking in and asking how, how they're doing, if they need any cultural items, you know, do they need to burn sage or burn cedar, which is what we do in, in my tribe in Oklahoma? Do they need that? Do they do they need, you know, an elder um, to come in? Do they need that support? I think that's really important. And I think, um, you know, Hennepin is, we've had an American Indian advocate, you know, since the American Indian movement um, funded that position, you know, a number of years ago. And now we most recently have um, hired, um, clinical, what they call an American Indian clinical navigator, which kind of serves in that same role. But we're expanding those types of services. We made it possible for people to smudge and things like that in the hospital. Um, so I think just being cognizant of and asking uh, if those types of things are needed. Um, and then, you know, really facilitating things with the family, um, the elders of the, of that, you know, of the tribe, et cetera, when those things are, are pertinent and necessary. I think those are the things that I would say. And it would help too. I mean, if you had a lot of a lot of Daryls out there, you know, people that were um, you know, representative of the culture, right? I mean, that would be the ideal state is if we had people for, that actually represent uh, the community being the ones to approach the family. That is really an ideal state. I mean, it's obviously, that's a lot of work that needs to be done to have that happen. And I think that if you do have somebody that can do that, and that that is uh, really really fortunate for that organization. And, and Tom, you what you stated is correct. You know, here at New Mexico Donor Services, we have a couple of family care coordinators, uh, two of them who are Navajo and can speak fluently in Navajo to, you know, talk and discuss with whether it be the elder in the Navajo language or their family members who are very fluent and proficient in English because they may have to do translation where a lot of the medical clinical terms don't exist in the languages. And we also have a, another lady from the Pueblo of Isleta, who's also one of her family care coordinators. So to, as you stated, to have someone who's within the tribes, who's local, who 
literally, as you stated, is one of us. That's where a lot of the walls and barriers start coming down to ask those questions. You know, do you need a medicine man here in your room? We have privacy rooms there. You can bring in your sage or your medicine bundles. You know, those type of cultural competency teachings and pieces, I think, still can be strengthened and enhanced, not only here at whether it be life source uh, donor services, but other OPOs, as well as other organizations such as Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Presbyterian, United Health, and those other health organizations as well. Thanks, Daryl. Um, I'm saying Wooten Cam, because I'm not sure the first name of this individual. Uh, there's a question, uh, and I'm, I'm what I'm interpreting with this question is, is there staff, maybe who's on the call, um, who might be able to provide uh, information about experiences about approaching families to counteract the decline. So the decline to, to donate is what I'm is what I'm guessing here. Is there another traditional consideration or teaching uh, to take into consideration? I hope I hope I got that right. Yeah, again, I would I would ask others to kind of weigh in on this, given that they do the work. I, I think there's opportunity, you know, in that question, because if you are able to get some scripting or some, you know, education, um, something that would would really help with that interaction. And then that would have to be from someone from the culture who will, um, you know, be able to guide that type of, of, of conversation, that dialogue, it would be really helpful. And if every, every OPO had the, you know, the ability to have, if you didn't have a person that could go and, and, and talk to a family in person, that at least you would have um, the one approaching armed with some tools to, to really have a, a true conversation. I see, Ron, I see you have your, your hand up and I apologize, I, I didn't see that earlier. I don't know if you just put your, your hand up. Did you wanna um, go off? Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Um, Ron here, I'm also with New Mexico Donor Services uh, Public Education Coordinator. Uh, I'm the president of the AMAT uh, Native American Work Group. Um, and I would like to invite everybody to, we have a webinar uh, actually this week on Thursday. 12 noon Mountain Standard Time. You could go to amat1.org. And it's exactly what we're discussing here about uh, approaching Native American families. And um, and we also we have uh, one of the family care coordinators that Daryl has spoke about, Sonia, who's going to be talking about that. We also have uh, Nakona Burgess, who is um, uh, one of our great artists that created a really beautiful piece to help uh, Create an art piece to help discuss and bring out the start that conversation within the Native American population uh, that we shared on the AMAT toolkit as well. Uh, so go to amat1.org and you can see our webinar and you can register for that and you hear what our staff, our direct line staff, are doing and how they are approaching the family care coordinators, what their what their approach style is and what they're doing to uh, help increase those rates. Ron, Thanks, could Ron. you put that link in the uh, chat, please, so people can uh, look into that? Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Appreciate that. Anyone else want to share? Um, I'll just share one more thing. Um, Tom, Nicole, again, thank you for the opportunity to join you and uh, to discuss, to, again, open the doors. You know, it's always about learning. And if we don't learn, if we don't continue to go forward, you, you stand still and the world takes you over. So this has always been, this is always a wonderful discussion. Um, I'm very close with uh, the new executive director of the National Congress of the American Indian. His name is uh, Larry Wright Jr. He's the former chair for the Ponca Indians in Nebraska. And I was just informed a couple of weeks ago the National Congress of American Indian had their annual conference in Sacramento. Their mid-year conference in 2023 will be in St. Paul. So there's an opportunity to have a marketing table. And if we could uh, partner up uh, donor services, life source, 
to get an information booth and a table. And uh, I've also been asked if we could even do a presentation in the 2023 annual 80th convention in Florida, if we would want to put on a, um, a breakout session for what donors transplantation, uh, we could inform a lot of people in one setting. I mean, that's, you know, something I would just like to throw out and give food for thought, you know, coming up in the upcoming year. Wow. All right. Let's, let's talk, Daryl. <laughs> so like a great opportunity. Yes. Yeah. No, because like, as you stated, a lot of these topics are very taboo, very private, embarrassing at times. So then, you know, you know, and to speak from personal experience, you know, my sister was an ACL recipient. My mom's cousin was a heart transplant recipient. Even myself, uh, my second day on the job last year, I was, I had a heart attack. And to be told if a stent, if a bypass don't work, we're going to have to fly you out for a heart transplant is a very sobering event in your life. So I think now is the time to start discussing and talking about those that are on dialysis and how we can provide a better choice and a better lifestyle. And I think the time is near. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. And I one of the things uh, Tom and I were talking about, I think several times, was um, how do we kind of insert this conversation about donation as a as a normal part of talking about health and wellness and communities, um, and knowing that this is so talking about prevention, but then again, talking about um, if things get to that point is looking at this as, you know, being able to give the gift of life um, to another. Um, wanted to bring up this question. I know that we're getting close to time here. Um, I think this is a really important question that someone had posed. And this is balancing the, the balancing listening to a family and the, what we call getting to yes. And so how do we sit with families where emotions are raw, where people are hurting, people are in pain, when a loved one has, uh, has transitioned um, and still progress forward in donation conversations? So how do we balance the two? It's a great question. And I think a uh, presentation by Sonia will address a lot of that because she's frontline center. In fact, I uh, wish she could have joined us, but she's uh, on a case at Presbyterian Hospital in Albuquerque right now. So in fact, she was the one who approached my family when my uncle passed away at the beginning of the year from uh, COVID complications. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not only to deal with, you know, any tribal member, but in particular, one of your own in your own Pueblo or your own tribe, I'm sure she will be able to address that better than any of us ever could. I look forward to that, that webinar. I'm going to try to attend. Do you know, Daryl, um, that if you can't attend live, will it be recorded and will it be accessible for to people? It will be recorded. Uh, it'll be on AMAP uh, website and on their, on their social media, they'll post it right away. Okay, thank you, Ron. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Um, Ron, so that um, in terms of accessing that, so you provided the the both you and Kimberly, I believe, thank you both, uh, the link for the webinar. Um, where might people be able to access the webinar? Yeah, Will so it be the same uh, what's the yeah, same on that link? website, the link I sent you, unfortunately, you didn't create a link that you could just click on directory. You have to go to the uh, scan the QR code on that on the page that I sent over um, and the link. Just go to that link and it'll take you to uh, a graphic and there will be a QR code that you scan and that will then take you to the registration page. Unfortunately, they didn't create a, um, a link link to go straight to it. So you have to scan the QR code. Got it. Great. Thank you. I'd like to just offer... Um, a couple of comments from a, a few team members who have um, worked with uh, Native families um, here in our um, donor service area. Uh, so this question about when we let's how do we sit and listen and and sit and respect and still progress forward in donation conversations 
<clears throat> a couple of team members had had this to say. Um, one does this by sitting and listening respectfully. Be clear about time limitations that are real. We need to be thoughtful and intentional about the conversation starts. Using resources of organ donation professionals who have trained for this conversation and working with a family, walking alongside a family to set a pace for conversation. So not always about the getting to yes, but the walking with a family and being conscientious about, um, as I mentioned, the conversation starts, which I think is, is, um, is really important. All right, so I think we've got um, one more question that I think we can get in, and, and, and this is a, this has actually come up with us um, as well, and I would imagine with some of their OPOs who are maybe on the call. Um, uh, can either Tom and or Daryl <laughs> or Ron, <laughs> um, any of you speak to this question about um, when a uh, person registers to be a donor and yet there is opposition from family members to honor that decision? Daryl and Ron, I defer to you. <laughs> I, I think that again, uh, our webinar having, uh, we are in pub ed, right? We are the ones who are on the backside of this. And I think Sonia being uh, as the um, frontline staff could probably answer that a lot better. I know that I'll just give a, a brief snapshot. We approach every family and we, we will stick with that family even if it's a yes or a no, and we still provide the same care that we'd give uh, that grieving family if they, if they decide to move on with donation or not. But I think it'd be unfair for us as pub ed people to really answer that question directly. I think that would have to be something that uh, in our webinar that Sonia will be able to answer a lot better than we can. Um, so I think that without doing more shameless plugs to attend our webinar, right? But also <laughs> to get here exactly from what our family care coordinators are out there, we are not in the hospital, hospital Daryl and I are not. We are out trying to get people to register um, to be donors, but we are not the ones who are actually there at the hospital bedside and dealing with the, with the grieving family. So again, I think Sonia would probably be the best. Uh, she would probably give a lot more concise and precise message when it comes down to that. So, uh, you know, that again, if you can't attend, it will be recorded and you can be able to access that and hear what she has to say. And if you have specific questions, you know, you can send them on to me. I'll put my my email in the chat. We could actually put that in um, to that. So uh, feel free. Right. I'm going to put my email in there now. Uh, send them to me. Uh, and I'll gladly try to put those as slides and as things she talks about. But uh, let's let's let give her a chance to really give that that direct answer. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. Uh, just a couple of comments from again some of our uh, team members who have um, have run into this actually. And just one question from E Denise Peoples, um, Deanna maybe or Glenn maybe you, the two of you can um, address this question if. I'm assuming if the information, there's a lot of really great information in the chat, if this will be shared with participants on the webinar today is a question that came up. Um, so this question around registry opposition from families um, when the patient is a registered donor, um, one of our team members had to say this about that, that question. Um, in their experience, most conflict around do donation is not against donation in particular, um, yet as a response to not understanding or accepting a grim prognosis um, and or brain death diagnosis. Um, it can also be, and this is getting at the, the question around the conversation starters, can be the timing in which donation was brought up regarding um, the, 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 the prognosis and then um, just the situation, the, the difficulty of the situation. All right. So I think we're, we're, we've got a few minutes. Um, I was told we got to end a few minutes early. Um, Tom, I want to just thank you again um, for your really great presentation. I've heard this a couple of times now, and it just becomes more and more powerful each time I hear it. Daryl and Ron, thank you both so much for your contributions to this conversation. Mm -hmm. And again, um, 
many, many thanks to all of you for joining um, this webinar session today. Thank you so much. And Deanna and Glenn, I think I'll turn it back over to you. And I put my email in within the chat if uh, you want to uh, shout out or you know ask some questions feel free contact me ron also just did as well and tom thank you for sharing your email address i'll reach out to you here as well very good thanks daryl thanks thank, ron. You. thank you all yes and if i can i just i just want to jump in and say on behalf of the alliance a huge thanks to you dr wyatt and nicole for such a phenomenal presentation and discussion i it's it's clear just based on the comments that have been coming in i've been getting a couple of private messages as well that this has really been a very powerful and impactful um, presentation. So I thank you so much for, for sharing some of the historical context, but also applying it to healthcare practice and, and helping us all to better understand how we can support um, our, our Native American um, counterparts. So thank you so much um, for all the insights that were shared today. I know there are a couple of comments and questions about um, access to the resources that were shared, like the presentation, as well as today's recording. All of that will be posted on our website uh, within the next 24 hours or so, so you can all be on the lookout for that. Certainly for those of you that registered, you'll receive that email communication directly. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Um, Ron, Daryl, thank you for also sharing your contact information. Um, for those of you who weren't able to grab that, we'll try to include that in some of our um, outgoing communications to you as well. Certainly that 8MAT presentation looks like it'll be a good one for all of you to join in continuation of the conversation here today. So once again, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us. And um, with that, take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.